Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to say thank, of course, Wyatt and Barbara and Megan and Adam and the wonderful staff. I could name them all, but there's so many, and I'm afraid my reading will go on too long. <laughs> and my wonderful workshop. I mean, people who are always smiling and kind and receptive. And of course, all the people I work with and get to see um, and live with on the hall, which is very nice, I must say. I, I really, I loved camp as a girl, and uh, <laughs> it's the same. Okay, so, but I will get started. I'm reading from this new book, Pure Hollywood, and I'm not going to read an entire story, but I hope to uh, stop at a, a place that's fitting. And um, I, my apologies to anyone, um, to, certainly to those of my colleagues who have, have listened to this before, but I would like to say that I have added a few things and <laughs> fixed a few things, I hope. So, Pure Hollywood. How disappointing it was to wake intact and far away from the matchstick aftermath of the extinguished fires, thready smoke rising from piles that had been homes, the famous modern ho house not among them. Mimi? He asked quietly, driving up a slight incline and into a space still hers everything, all of it, a modern house shaped like slung plates, no corners, different heights. What do you think this place is worth, he asked, still whispering so as not to disturb. What? There was only the house. What's it worth? It's like living in a great fucking painting is what it is. The place is priceless. The house was not that much cooler than the car, and Mimi went through it and opened windows and the sliding door to the terrace. I know I'm letting in hot air, she said, but I hate things shut. She moved off to the kitchen and offered Stetson a drink. What are you doing, he asked as he found and filled two glasses with ice. I'm taking off my clothes, she said. They smell of smoke. I should go ahead and burn them. Off came her shell and the wavy pants that shivered down the chair rail as fast as she threw them. Underneath, she wore what looked like string. There wasn't much to her. <laughs> Fuck, Stetson said. His shirt was off, his pants, his shoes. He sniffed his arm. My arm stinks. He put his arm up to his sister's nose. What is that? Pickles, she offered. <laughs> What did you have for lunch? He sniffed his other arm. Nothing. All the pleasure to be had in looking at Stetson, but Mimi had married Arnold Fine, ugly as an anvil, Arnie, <laughs> and, dr had, and driven her brother away. Less than a month ago, her husband stepped into the pool and died, age 69, heart attack. Happened fast, and what happened after came on faster, the ambulance, the body bag, the funeral home, the furnace. He was ashes in a matter of minutes. Mimi poured vodka into her glass. Tonic, she pointed to the counter, and there's Perrier. Tap was okay with Stetson, but did she have any food? How can you be hungry? Smell your arm, she said. <laughs> Wearing pointy mules, Mimi walked onto the terrace to a hockney scene, only not so blue, more green. The lounge chairs were rightly low and wide, hewn from wood that would outlast them. But the pool, Mimi said, the pool's a swampy squiggle, I'm afraid, decorative. What do you think it's worth? She asked and watched him assess the place. This is like old times, Mimi said, and walked into the water to her waist. You're tempting me, he said. How do you insure a priceless place? You don't. For a time, she stared at the house, then walked out of the pool and took up her glass and hang banged the cubes against her teeth, chewed ice. She adjusted her strings distracted by leaves wooden in the wind, if only the wind weren't so hot. Is there someone here, 
Stetson asked. The gardener? A gardener seemed to have come with the house, a man not so new as ignored. The gardener had a leaf blower. The plants weren't a problem, but the grotesque tree shed. Brown leaves, long as shoes, got shuffled around the walkways until the nameless gardener came to blow them out of sight. They disappeared, just as the gardener disappeared, week to week. Sometimes Mimi heard the hacking cough of his truck, sometimes his blower. Today, she heard nothing. There was nothing much to blow away, nothing dead in the pool, but the slack hose jumped, distended, and withdrew around the house, followed by the sound of water. It had to be the gardener. Mimi went to see, and yes, it was the gardener, misting the front of the house. He had nodded at her. What was wrong with him? Didn't he read the papers? Someone, not Mimi, not today, would have to tell him there was no more work here. She walked back to Stetson, enjoying the tack tack of her shoes against the stone terrace, a sound both slutty and indulgent right out of the movies. But was it Mimi right out of the movies? She was pretty enough. Everyone said, does this feel like home to you, he asked. Yes, she said, and she adjusted the chair to lie flat, eyes closed, given over to the liquidy heat lapping her pale body. We weren't married long enough for anyone to believe I loved Arnie, she said, but I did. He made me laugh, honestly, aren't you hot? She sat up, wiped her eyes, and walked into the pool. Come in with me. The water's cold, but you'll get used to it. If his sister was thin, he was thin too, jailbird sickly with his arms held up as he waded in, testing. The pool was not very deep, which might explain the slightly yellow color of the water, and the sky too was a creepy kind of yellow, a spreading dread. Do you think, she began and didn't finish. She said, the gardener's hosing down the house. When's the last time this pool was cleaned? Stetson treaded water and looked around him. Just the color, he said, which along with slimy tiles was sickening and he did his swimming such as it was in the middle. He dived under, he made a few strokes down and back. Only the tiles along the ledge of the pool seemed unclean, and he avoided the ledge until the last minute when he lifted himself out. Hey, she said, where are you going? Inside. In the kitchen, he refilled his glass and drank enough to fill it again before he set it on the counter. His medicine made him thirsty. Mimi came up from behind, and he flinched at her touch. Water splattered against the window. The gardener was close. You don't get it. I do, she said. You're sober, and I'm not. He said, that's right. Then he took up his glass and walked down the hall into the bathroom where a clunking noise sig signaled his intention to shower. From the looks of the soap, discolored, cracked, no one had used the downstairs shower for some time. Tepid, reddish water pooled at his corpsey feet, and the clunk of the pipes when he turned off the water echoed, sounding spooky. He couldn't do much with a hand towel, and his long hair dripped onto his collar and down the back of his white shirt. At least he felt cool. At least dressing and the hotter prospects of the hours to come didn't dismay him. But his sister, just getting past her, was hard. Mimi stood almost as he'd left her in the kitchen, listening to nothing he could hear, but her expression suggested the sound grated. What is it? You don't hear that? Not the pipes. There it is again. All he heard was the high-pitched present. Stay, she said. I can't, he said, 
and said again to himself as he backed onto a steep road that wound through the dry brush down the hillside past other drives and tucked away houses. The houses he could see were messy blots on other hills, expensive blots. Stetson didn't have much money, but whose fault was that? He knew that's what his sponsor would say. Why not whine home to daddy and ask some sponsor? The late afternoon sky he saw was the same Mimi saw, leached of all its color. Mimi, with her eyes stung by the smoke or crying or both, drew the draperies and turned on a downstairs light, a small flame in the gloom of the mostly bare and sunken living room. The Eames chair, her husband's, startled her. Where had it been that she had not seen it? Then her lawyer, making good on his word, called, and she learned what she already knew. Nothing was hers. Briefly sober, she called Stetson's cell to say she wasn't going to drink anymore, and she wished he would come back. She didn't like to be home alone in the house. I want to get better. I want to get over this. I wish you'd pick up. She blipped off, hurt to think he hadn't even answered a call with her name. She fixed herself more of the same and lowered the blinds in the kitchen and in the dining room to spy on the gardener as he moved around the house. His expression was hard to make out, but she watched him wrestle the hose into a terracotta pot. The hose must have weighed more than he did, poor man. When she thought he might come to the front door, Mimi took off her mules and crept through the house up the floating staircase to what she had made into her bedroom where she hid between the bed and the wall. She waited. She waited for a long time, which was perhaps what he did, the gardener, in his garden colors. He stood outside the door in good faith of payment, but for what? hosing down the house against fires, mounting staghorn ferns. What had he done today, this gardener? And why was it she knew him only as shadowy and poor? His stunted children rest their chins on the kitchen table. Sticky fly strips hang near the sink and back door. His wife's scorched hair is in the rice and on his tongue. Now the rice tastes dirty. Look elsewhere. Forget the shapeless face of his fat son. There is his favorite. There, his daughter, over near there, near the fly strip, shaking cinnamon on everything she eats. Even beans, he asks her. The gardener. Where was he now? The gardener's truck was gone. The gardener was gone, left without being paid. Now, how will he be those children. Driving east into the sensation of a rising sun, driving into mountains made no more attractive than dung by that same sun, not seen, not seen. Stetson was driving without any music, and Jesus, it hurt to look at it. The desert house as he remembered it a rusted box on stilts in the garden made of white crushed rock and cacti, too forbidding to play near, although their mother sat among the stolid barrel heads blinking the pink spines in her cloud of absence. She liked to smoke and watch the sun drop behind the mountains on the other side of which were the Pacific and their father. Mother said their father was watching the same sky. But how did she know this? I do. When she said, I do, she would pout in the way she used to as an actress, and for a moment she was Sabine, a guard again, and not their mother. Why weren't they in school? Their mother said they could make up the weeks missed in summer at home in L.A. Their mother made a face Sabine Agard made in movies, shifty. She turned away on the baked stone. She sat barrel-like and spined in fishhook spines to find a sea, yet they knew enough not to brush against their mother. They sat quietly and waited out the sky until it dulled. 
Mimi's job was to fry eggs for a breakfast dinner, Stetsons to put out plates. They made a lot of noise. It felt good. Turned on the radio, and the Mexican guys in sombreros sang Las Mananitas. Great cracks from the bacon Mimi poked made them jump and roused their mother, who sniffed her way in but looked through them. The bacon buckled, and the yolks broke. Careful. Mother said, but too late. Grease prickled Mimi's arms, and she yelped. No long good night tonight, they knew. No books, no songs, no prayers, no promises, no stories about when. When you were born, when you were two, was there ever a time before them, really? Yes. Since they had moved to the desert, mother thought most about what happened before with people they didn't remember or hadn't known. Stetson shunned the eggs and stuck wadded fat from the bacon up his nose. That's disgusting, Mimi cried. But their mother was already gone. Best not think about how she did it how half in and out of the bed she was, pills, goblets, gobbets, blood. Even then, he was thinking of soldiers and dragons and fortifications. You didn't see anything. I didn't either. Mimi told the helpline their mother wasn't waking up, but that their mother was alive. How did Mimi know that? I didn't. I was afraid. I got you out of the house. Do you remember? We sat in the cactus garden. The sun wasn't over the mountains and the desert was cool. After a while, an ambulance came. He could only pretend to remember. Everything about his mother's suicide came from newspapers and magazines. Stetson was nine years old at the time. Mimi was 11. Someone drove them to a little airport, put them on a little plane, they knew they were going to their father because his name was repeated, Jack DeMenth, Mr. DeMenth, said in tones that made him out to be an important man working from afar. Jack DeMenth, at 70, masseused and smoothed as a skinned almond, orderly and fit, no swollen or discolored parts about him, but he attended to them, got themselves fixed, saw the right doctor, bought a better, more expensive chair or piece of equipment to pedal. He was pedaling now at home alone and watching while on the TV fires unevenly advanced again in the Malibu Hills. He was safe, but his daughter wasn't, was she? Jack had warned Mimi, comedians don't retire. They just get more depressed. <laughs> Arnie Fine, once a funny man, had died of a curdled heart. How many times had Jack told her, Arnie Fine will not make you laugh? But she had insisted he did. Arnie may have made others cry, but not her. Mimi said he was funny to her. What's odd is that a comedian would marry someone like me with no sense of humor. And then, in a sly voice, must be something else about me, which even to remember made Jack uncomfortable. Later in the morning, Jack DeMenth told his trainer about Arnie Fine, not mentioning his daughter, Mimi. The trainer had never heard of Arnie Fine. The trainer was from one of those places in Eastern Europe that Jack associated with mass graves in the woods and wet wool coats. I don't know this man, he shouted. Everything the trainer said came out loud. But to be fair, when Jack thought about it, as a Chechen, the poor bastard had probably survived by being loud. For lunch, Jack had a vegetarian concoction, kale, lemon, mint, and a stringent drink that made his blood fizz. He drank water, several glasses of water, along with the kale juice. His lunch companion, his secretary, Jody, had the same. How does that make you feel, Jack asked. 
full? <laughs> Where to after lunch but Walmart for slippers? He needed new slippers. Jack had his driver take him to Walmart and two of them walked through the store until they found slippers. Everyone in this country is fat, Jack said. And he made no effort to be discreet, but repeated himself as he sensed approach, which happened from time to time, so that he said something repellent, something about the aisle and its width, the super size, quantities of crap. He considered a tub of mayonnaise. Jack let his driver pay for the slippers, but before he could take up the receipt, he heard the low utterance of his name and was ruffled by the flurry of two women passing. In the car, Jack told his driver the next stop was Malibu. He wanted to see for himself. Was the famous house still standing? Yes, the house. A stacked appearance as of a backbone. He could see it. The house, named after its architect, Alessandro Piero, the Piero house, was upright. Jack could see it as the car took the last turn, but was his daughter in it? He should know, but they had stopped speaking when Mimi told him she had married Arnie Fine. At home again in the room, he called a study despite the toys in it, treadmill, golf club, small weights. Jack called Stetson. If you're so worried, Dad, why don't you call her? For his part, Stetson was sorry for whatever legal tangle Mimi was in with Arnie Fine's children, children decades older than Mimi. The man's dead. Call her for condolences, at least. Oh, Mimi, Jack said when he called his daughter and listened for as long as he could to what she had done and what she had yet to do. The reading of the will, an auction, Jack DeMinth didn't understand any of it. Whatever were you thinking, Mimi? Nothing I've done so far would suggest I'm very bright, Dad. The eyes should be just about here, Arnie said. And he pointed two tiny frown crescents above his cheeks. If his cheeks were red, he would have looked like a sad elf. But Arnie's skin was a sallow, yellow, dingy where he shaved, and he shaved poorly, so he looked like an ill-intentioned elf with black bristles and acne scars, fat creases serving as a neck, a face hard to touch, much less kiss, and he knew it. He didn't care, had never cared, or maybe he didn't care anymore. What was the difference? He was rich. He was funny. His face was funny. The bowling ball shape of his head was classically funny. Also, the baldness helped. Was there ever a fat comedian with a lot of hair? <laughs> Probably, but the ones that came to mind who looked like him, the Don Rickles of the world, had withering hairlines. Fine was more of a body comic. He wasn't unkind. He loved women and bemoaned his bad luck with them. And his wife, he had always loved Ruthie, no matter what anyone said, but celebrity and money had made him more attractive to women at 60 than at any other time in his life. Bimbos, starlets, yeah, sure, breasts solid as hams with anuses no bigger than his pinky, but fuck all. <laughs> A girl under age, for fucking sure, on a frigid night in Minnesota, found at the back door with a spiral notebook and a crummy pen. It dried out just as he was signing the fucking cold, he said, and saw her tears. From him or from the cold? Ever been in a limousine, he asked. Want to take a ride and warm up with me? I have a driver, he said. You can show me what to see. He was tired after that tour, bone tired, deep tired. Something must have been around that time Mimi DeMint found him. He wasn't exactly looking, but Mimi DeMint liked him. Do you feel safe with me, he asked. Of course, she said. You know who my father is, don't you? 
So he took advantage of the moment and the money he had made, money enough to have a famous house and a fast car and time on his hands to let a young woman who loved to drive, drive anywhere. If he had reasons to suspect his heart was clogged, he overlooked them. Let her drive fast. Let her try her hand at whatever might make her happy. Arnie Fine was gone, and in his place stood his son, Donald, with look-alike cheeks, buckshot from acne, a sad inheritance, but not Mimi's. On good days, she could see her mother's face in hers. Today, with the lawyers and auctioneers at the Piero house, her face was entirely her own and crooked. And Arnie's daughter? Mimi figured Patricia Fine for an updated Ruthie, the late, great, long sufferer who had shoved Arnie Fine through the 1980s, made him famous, if not sober. Ruth Gable Fine, with her frizzy red hair, small eyes, mother to the lumpen twosome, had led Donald Fine to believe he was charming. Upon their meeting, he had put his heavy hands on Mimi's shoulders and looked at her approvingly, saying, Now I get it. He said, No wonder we never met before. He said, How old are you? And he winked to let her in on what? At least Patricia Fine ignored her. Patricia Fine had come to the Piero house for a painting. The Diebenkorn patty, really? Since when did you even notice it? Don't call me patty. I mean, you've never expressed interest in dad's art before. Do you even know what it's called? Oh, okay, he said, but his sister kept her back to him, unyielding. Patricia, he said, and then emphatically, Patricia! In the Piero house, and ever alert for cover, Mimi had a foot on the stair for the guest bedroom in the gully between the bed and the wall of the curtain, the window from which vantage she had spied on the gardener, the gardener she could not pay. He had waited at the door, the gardener, indistinguishable, blending against the shedding eucalyptus in its dead bowl of shaggy bark. She missed him. In all the easy days she was married, Miss, dement, she said, but I'm still the widow. Yes, he said, I'm aware. This man with his hand on her arm, a man not family but employed, maybe an overseer, a caretaker, a lawyer, a guard, an auctioneer, gestured toward the herding warmth of the fines, a pack of them, old cousins with old children, an ancient uncle, uncle with a menacing walker. Mimi pointed up the stairs, her intent. It's a viewing, he said, first floor only. But I'm not interested in anything, she said. No one's to go upstairs, he said. My room's upstairs, she said. I'm not entirely moved out. I'm sorry, miss. I'm the wife, she said. I'm the fucking widow. I'm sorry. She veered away from Mr. Security and walked toward a corner out of the way. What was it she had said to Stetson about the Piero house? Priceless. Last week it had seemed invulnerable in all the ways Arnie had said it was. None of the fires ever came close. An important house, one of a kind, like a great classic. The classic cars, Maserati, Ferrari, Mustang. It was a work of art, irreplaceable. Inside the important house was another matter. The tubular furniture, a lot of it unfriendly, was gone, but its absence hardly enlarged the downstairs spaces crowded with inheritors, shoving in to see the art and counting up play money. Patricia Fine circled the Diebenkorn, flicked a notebook, looked elsewhere looked out the sliding glass windows to the terrace and the pool where her father had died. Mimi had found him, Arnie, face down in the water. No chance for a funny last line, this is no way to live. 
Had Arnie known he had so little time left, he might have spent it differently. As it was, his wife was dead, and he didn't particularly like his children. So he married Mimi and followed her whims. He had stood in front of Mimi, his hands lightly appraising her, this old man at the end of his career and this young woman at the start of her, what, could she call herself an actress? Please, God, not a celebrity's child. Whatever were they doing together? Mimi got it. She understood why people wondered. But the magic hat the old comedian put on, how he made her laugh at herself mostly, her silly, selfish ways, her habit of eating all the nuts from the ice cream, all the swirls of caramel, too. He made her look into the carton at the gouged mound and asked, does this look appetizing to you, sweetheart? Anything like me? She only had to be herself with Arnie, and he was delighted. You're allowed, he said. Be your sweet, strange, selfish self. Arnie Fine had her driven to the studio when she was in the pilot that did not get picked up. He didn't live to learn that the studio bumped it, but if Arnie were around, he would say, they didn't see you coming, doll. He said, they're just not ready for what you've got. Now she walked out the sliding glass door and sat in the shallow end of the emptied pool. Some firm in charge, maybe the gang inside, had set up folding chairs and a couple of card tables, and she watched as the aggressive old man maneuvered his walker to sit up close. She was glad the house was sealed, glad not to hear the noise inside until Donald came out to the terrace and said, you wanted. After the house was dismantled, Donald Fine asked what she planned to do with the Mustang Arnie had left her buffed and ready at a downtown garage. Drive it? First date with Arnie, they went from dipping sauces and luau-like drinks to the dead horse parking lot in Topanga Canyon where she played his Mustang. Oh, she had known from the start what an old gnome given to chuckling would like a silly show-off who liked to make tight turns and empty lots, tight as my ass, Ernie, he was fun. How was it he had had such dull children? <laughs> Blame Ruthie? A mother cannot be held accountable for all the children's failings, for ignorance and bad taste. Donald Fine drove a chrome heavy car he must have thought hot. I could use a drink. Donald said, and for some stupid reason, oh, vodka at Ricky, she said yes. She could use a drink, too, and she canceled the car that was to take her to the hillside rental she'd found and buckled into Donald's car for the short drive to Ricky's. A vodka at Ricky's, yes, but as soon as the glacial-looking pool of clear fuel was set before her, Mimi knew she had made another bad decision. She saw the dusk ahead, on and on and so forth, and then there was that time when Donald told her how Arnie Fine had left him at a party for some choice tale. Donald said he grew up on fumes of pussy. His father, that miserable father, Fuck, funny man, Arnie, fine. You should know, he said. But she didn't know. And she didn't know, and over two hours were junked until it came to this. She didn't know old movies, which made Donald really angry. You never saw dinner at eight? I don't get you. You're not alone, she said. But all this to do about an actress in a movie she hadn't seen? I'm saying, Donald started quiet, she said. I'm trying to hear what they're saying. A woman in the booth behind them, just a voice, said rather loudly, how's she doing? She's a lot better. She's well enough to say her daughter's an asshole. <laughs> there was more, but it was lost with Donald's blurted business, waving the bill, saying, will you look at this? Outside the restaurant, he said, I mean, why go for a drink with someone 
if you're not going to talk. They said nothing more to each other until they were in the car when Donald moaned how he couldn't take this sick shit. What did you and my dad ever have in common? He didn't really like his kids, and neither do I. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Despite the theatrical thunderhead rising above the mountains, Mimi drove toward it, drove into the desert with the top down at speeds equally dramatic. She wore cat's eye sunglasses and a tied on straw bonnet, the rim of which blatted in the wind. Desert driving in a convertible. All of my cars have been convertibles, in her mother's voice. If only she could hear it. But Mimi's memory for any part of her mother was dismally approximate. To see the house again might help, but how to find it? A lot of people had cactus gardens. What made her think theirs was special? She passed through towns no bigger than beads and in between drove over 80 miles an hour. The clouds advanced in electric air. She looked up and felt the first large sloppy drops of rain. The rain fell faster and she slowed up the car, pumped the brake, then braked hard and slewed onto the shoulder. She got the top up, but not before it wet the dash. Yet, for all the water that fell from the sky, First the pockety sound, puffs of dust, then a downpour. The desert floor only steamed when it was over, hardly wet. For her mother, the desert was home. Sabine Agard, her mother's real name, and no one in Hollywood had ever suggested she change it, was born in Algiers. Her first language was French, and her accented English came out haltingly and often sounded like a small cry. She was very tiny. She wore a size four and a half shoe and size zero clothes. It didn't take a lot to kill her. <laughs> Mimi thought if she could find a house, Sabine's troubled spirit might talk to her without talking to her as when they watched the dramas of fiery clouds dissipate in the desert sky and Sabine warned Mimi in the very way she watched that men were dangerous. Mimi bought water at the gas station and held the bottle against her face and considered the journey. How many hours out of LA and here already, now what? She bought a map and studied it, Culp, Canyon, Sweetbush, and hoped she might find the street, then find the house, commune with Sabine, figured out the future. It didn't surprise her then that a man should step up to ask what she was looking for, and might he help? His name was Zorn. He was from L.A., but he had a home in the desert. An attractive woman waited in the front seat of a Mercedes convertible, although Mimi's Mustang was better. Mimi said she was looking for a house she had lived in a long time ago. She couldn't remember the street, but the house was unusual, at least to her. Then, a girl not quite 12, the house she remembered didn't look like a house, but like a pile of rusted salvage welded together. The cactus garden was dressed in stone. He couldn't help her there, he said, and he was sorry. And so was she. The Indian who sold her the map at the convenience store didn't know the area either. He hauled up words in his heavy accent, was everyone in the desert from somewhere else, and dropped them at her feet until, tired, he simply ceased to speak. At the Best Western, the man at the front desk told Mimi the house had probably been swallowed up by the bottle brush development, and he showed her the way. She got herself a room, then drove out to find bottle brush and off bottle brush, an unpaved road. She remembered that much, no other houses nearby, but now how strange it was to see house after house of what she sort of remembered and the same stone cactus gardens, some with corroded ornaments, tin road runners and jackrabbits and sunflowers, <laughs> sunflowers especially out of place. They had a pool, she remembered, ordinary, small. Once, a photographer got access to the desert house and took photos of their mother stepping into the pool. In the photograph, 
her breasts were blurred. Her mother's former publicist and friend, Estelle, had given Mimi this photo and others at the memorial service, saying, you may not want to look at these now. And for a long time, Mimi didn't look. For a long time, she was angry at her mother. At the end of a washboard road, Mimi found a house that seemed alike enough, although its remembered welded quality had some how altered, whitewashed, or stuccoed, something. A garage as charmless as a storage shed was now attached to the house. If this was the house, and she thought it was, or it might be, given that it was the last house at the end of a long, rough road, the bucket chairs were gone, also the cacti, the desert looked the same from any angle, but the garden was just stone now a terrible white in the light that had followed the storm. Mimi knocked at the front door, but no one answered. She looked through a window and saw a churning gray as if the house were filled with water. She was about to knock again when a rattling car pulled roughly into the drive and nosed the garage. A woman in a sleeveless jean jacket opened the door. The woman's long arms were loose, all the fat tented near the elbow. She wore white tennis shoes. Her legs were greenly varicose. I hope you're not here about my son. No. I've told the authorities all I know. I, I don't know where he is. No, Mimi said. I'm here because I think I used to live here. This already seemed impossible. I doubt it, sweetie, the woman said. And Mimi was on the verge of agreeing it would have been in the mid-90s. The woman regarded her house with an appraising expression as if someone had offered her a lot of money for it. Why don't you come in and see? She took out two bags of groceries from the back seat and Mimi followed her into the house. Look familiar, the woman asked. Her name, she told Mimi, was Dora Wozak. She was putting big cans of tomato juice into the kitchen cupboard. Recognize anything? No, Mimi said, not really. Already she had forgotten the woman's name. You looking up all the old places? Mimi knew this was not the house, but once the jug of stoli was out of the bag, she didn't want to leave. <laughs> People came to the desert to dry out or drink, smoke or get spiritual, and this woman had the shape of a drinker. They drank from crystal quilted jars from when the woman, whose name Mimi still could not remember, made and sold prickly pear jelly. I had me quite a business for a while, she said. Then my husband died in Dean. That's my son. Got crazier. Mimi waited for her to say more, but she didn't. Instead, the woman asked about Mimi's car, how old it was and when she got it. Learning the car was a gift, she said. Someone sure like you. My husband, Mimi said, you look too young to be married. Well, I was. He died. I'm sorry, she said. Accident? Heart attack, Mimi said. He was older. God, girl, I hope he was really old. 69. How old are you? 28. My son's age, the woman said, Dean. And just as she said his name, the son, the mean Dean, slammed his way into the kitchen with a gun and shot his mother in the face. Then he saw, or seemed to see Mimi. He looked at her with no expression and what thoughts she couldn't even guess at, though she made no effort to move or to speak before he turned the gun on himself. That fast, Mimi sat mute witness to the immediate deflation of the body, the body shapeless and clothes on the instant turned loose in a kind of flesh melt, brain and bone and blood splatter on her shirt, the table, the floor, the window, her shoes in a puddle. This was a house, all right. Thank you. Okay.